Hi everybody, I'm Barry Joseph. Welcome to Making a Dino Dance, integrating a user-centric design process into a natural history museum. But before we begin, let's do a little show of hands. Be who knew before coming to MCN anything about what a user-centric design process could be or might look like? Okay, put your hands down. Put up your hands if you've actually had an opportunity to use it in your museum or previous museum. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, put up your hand if you knew that Pittsburgh has the oldest continuously owned seltzer works in the United <laughs> States. W well, you'll all know this a year from now. Excellent, he knew when my book Seltzertopia comes out in the fall. <laughs> all right, back to my day job. So I work at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City as the Associate Director for Digital Learning. We collect things that we can study and learn from, over 34 million so far. I also like to collect things and learn from them, in part through photos like these, posted on social media by visitors and geotagged to the location. Right, this family, for example, posted this jump in honor of completing the ground tour of the museum. Looking at these photos, we can see that visitors like outer space, they like dinosaurs, and, and so much more. But we, we already knew all that. We know what they like to go to. But what I love about these photos is that they can also show how visitors want to interact with the museum through goofy expressions, through filters. That's a statue on the right of our patron saint, Teddy Roosevelt. He doesn't actually have a dog nose. Through, through things perhaps we wish they'd ignore and maybe not look at. And through how they choose to share their identity. We found our peoples, she wrote, in the Hall of Asian Peoples. Or through turning a display of colorful minerals into a gay pride parade on the day of the gay pride parade in New York City and what they want to hug. There's a surprising number of hugging photos, it turns out, in the museum. <laughs> this process of observing our users and seeing what we can glean can be considered the first step in a user-centric or human-centric design process. Learning who our users are, what they need, and what they want through observation or through interaction, you know, surveys or interviewing them. And here's the key. Then using that information to inform whatever process is being used to design something for them. Within the area, I work at the museum, the Science Visualization Group. That means engaging visitors in permanent halls with modern science practices through the addition of digital layers of interpretation. What this looks like on the ground is working with one of our museum scientists, we have over 200, and then turning their digital specimens, whether it's CT scans, genomic data, astronomical observations, into a digital asset that we can port into a variety of digital tools to be tested with the public on Google Tango, HoloLens, The Vive, Merge, HoloCube, and more. We once went by the name of Science Bulletins, bringing the work of scientists, scientists into the permanent halls through videos. Now we're deploying our user-centric design process to publicly prototype and evaluate the data we collect by observing and interviewing the visitors. Last fiscal year, for example, we spent 57 hours, over 34 sessions, observing over a thousand people who experienced our new type of interactives and interviewing about 500 of them, all with internal staff and the great, great graduate students who are very appreciative who come help us out <laughs> all the time. And after 15 years of bringing the work of scientists to permanent halls through videos, the challenge now for us is to learn how, what are the best practices for bringing digital specimens from AMH scientists into the halls through interactive emerging media platforms. And to do this, we need to bring in new design practices. But before I get to abstract and to, provide some con and to provide some context, here's some examples of what we're working on last year. Don't worry about the audio. So in the upper left, we have the tango looking at a shark that's actually in front of you, but then mapped on top of it an animated version from a CT scan that the scientists study of that shark. Uh, on the right, we have uh, the Vive, and we have a CT scan of a weevil, but we create an environment where you're in an orange grove, you can hear the cicadas, and you suddenly shrink down to the size of the weevil. On the left, we're seeing exactly the same uh, digital specimen, the shark, but now in the HoloLens. So rather than holding up a 2D device, you're experiencing being immersed in a 3D environment. But unlike the virtual reality on the right, it's mixed reality. She can still see the space around her, and now she can use her voice to tell the shark to bite or to swim. In the bottom is the HoloCube. It's that black box. If you haven't seen it, it came out in August. Um, you hold it in your hand, and it's an AR marker. It's a three-dimensional AR marker. And so we're putting a CT scan of a foram, which is about the size of, you can see at the bottom, a grain of sand. But when it's a CT scan, you can blow it up, put it in your hand, turn around, and we animate it so it could open up. So we're employing user-centered techniques within an iterative design process. Plan, design, 
prototype, mm, and evaluate and review. And then go back to any steps you need to and keep doing it forever mm, until you stop. <laughs> right. So for example, and briefly, we tried various ways of using digital astronomical data to explain the three-dimensional nature of constellations. And this will be the example I'll use. So when you look up at the night sky, all the stars appear to lie in a single plane, as if each star was the same distance from you, and it's two-dimensional. But in fact, they're not. They sit in 3D space, and each star is a different distance from Earth. So if you left Earth, you'd start seeing this beautiful shape of a constellation that we grew up with suddenly distort in all sorts of strange and weird ways. Right? So the, the shape of a constellation is not fixed then. It, it changes depending on your point of view. If you can teach that idea, you can get people to understand that stars sit in a 3D space. So how can we use augmented reality or virtual reality to explain that much quicker than it just took me to say all that? Something you'd get right away. That's what we wanted to find out. So working with a slice of our digital universe 3D atlas, we created a digital asset that highlights a number of constellations, like Orion, picture here in our hall. And then we tested a variety of ways for people to interact with this digital model of space. First was the Tango experience, which is that, that tablet. In our hall of the universe, visitors viewed a virtual Orion constellation on the Tango, which they can move forward and backwards. Sorry, this is a little bit jumpy. To see the constellation shapes and lines change. Look in the upper right. You can see how it changes up there. The result, absolute failure. Visitors did not leave having learned that stars sit in a 3D space. If they knew it, it's because they knew it coming in. We concluded that was in part because constellations are too abstract. The points are real stars, but the lines don't actually exist. They're not real. So what happens when those lines change? People had a hard time interpreting it. But what if, we asked ourselves, we made the experience less abstract? Something you'd notice was different if its shape changed, like your face. Number two, your face in space. It'll take too long to explain, just except for some reason we had uh, an experience we developed once upon a time that we could use where if you saw your face, you could click on different points and it would turn it into not just a, the shape of a constellation, but the actual stars one would see from Earth. And so we used that. And we took this computer program on a laptop and invited visitors to do that, to map points around their face, switch the star names on and off, and then rotate their perspective around the new constellation to observe the distortion and see if they can make meaning from the results. And the results, mm, we weren't there yet. Many visitors experienced the rotation of the constellation as due to the constellation rotating, not their point of view rotating, right, which was not correct. What it turned out, we decided, was that the 2D medium was getting in, in the way of the message. In other words, what if instead we offered it through a 3D medium to teach this idea about 3D space? So number three, enter the HoloLens. Visitors now viewed a virtual Orion constellation through a HoloLens device, walking back and forth and around, Visitors viewed the constellation as existing in a 3D space, the same one that they occupied, with a backdrop of real stars. The result? It worked almost 100% of the time. While the first iteration failed to communicate the core idea, and the second one worked about half the time, the HoloLens version worked every time. As, as the visitors walked around or through their constellation, the stars moved at different speeds, depending on their distance from their, uh, their point. So now, we weren't done asking questions. Could we design for a more social experience? All these people were by themselves. Could we get them to interact with the people they came with? Right? What role could game mechanics play to, to shape that interaction? And that's the idea. We just kept asking questions. And we kept doing iterations, and we kept asking questions, and we kept doing iterations until it was time to put it aside and ask a different set of questions with a different digital specimen uh, in a different digital experience. Our goal was not to make a new product, but to rapidly prototype something we could bring to the floor so we could gain knowledge with real visitors in a real context. Once we felt like we learned enough, it was time to move on. And this process eventually led to a set of recommendations for our current work. But for more of that, come back next year. I'll talk about that. <laughs> but for now, for now, we can share some of what we learned. We started the year asking a number of questions, which the prototypes and the evaluations were designed to answer, such as, can we turn scientists' digital data into hall-based interactives? How can we create a social experience around digital specimens? Do visitors want an experience that can carry them throughout their visit? Here are some of the key findings, and just some of them. So, science data visualization for the win. <laughs> turns out, that's for the win, for FTW from gamers, for gamers, right? It turns out digital specimens produced by our over 200 scientists can be turned into floor-based digital interactives. That wasn't a given at the beginning of the year. CT scans are not initially designed for use on a mobile device. Right? If scientists need a level of, of um, resolution, it's way beyond what we need to give to visitors. We didn't know if it, how hard or easy it would be to make that adaption. It turned out it worked. And it turned out data visualizations provided a natural opportunity for engaging visitors. One asset, many platforms, different opportunities. With some effort, visualizations can be optimized for different platforms. 
However, all content does not work equally well across all devices, which have their own affordances. And they also vary in resolution, stereo capabilities, tracking, and modes of interaction. Content goals should be matched carefully to the technology. Number three, make experiences social. Visitors come to a museum primarily to socialize with friends and family. We all know that, but sometimes when we build technology experiences for them, we can't always figure out how to bridge that gap. But we found our work can support social interaction, specifically when we leverage multi-user platforms, create simple games, and promote active spectating by setting up live preview screens. Even if we don't have the screens, they still find ways to interact. <laughs> Number four, aim for universal design. Technology enables us to push the envelope on universal design with varied strategies, including multiple languages. More than 50% of our audience is comes from outside the US. That's a big issue for us. Audio controls and gesture-based interaction and more. We have a wide variety of visitors with a wide variety of needs, and we still have a lot to learn about how best to meet them. And number five, it takes a village. Museum staff have valuable knowledge about our visitors, youth and teacher educators, public program staff, visitor services employees, exhibition designers, communication and digital staff like Matt here who's gonna be talking tomorrow about some of this, all have relevant experience and knowledge that can help inform this work. We all need to get outside our <laughs> silos. So yeah, as we approach our 150th anniversary in 2019, we're old, not yet a dinosaur, but we can move slowly at times. But user-centric design is putting a new jig in our step. One might even call it a dance. I posted 12 posts to my blog yesterday, which go through one, which is the, the overview of all the stuff we learned, and then 11 on each of the different ones you saw. I just showed you one of the examples. So if you want to go deep into any of them, go to my blog at mushmi.org. My Twitter account's mushmi. Oh, it's cutting off the E, but the E is the last letter. Um, and do we have time for a question or two? Yeah, I, now we've got that, so. Okay, before, so before questions, some you might leave earlier. If you want to learn more about our work at the museum with VR and AR, as I mentioned, Matt Tarr and Vivian, my supervisor, will be here tomorrow um, at 2 o'clock to, uh, talking about is the future here, talking about VR and AR at the museum. And um, when I'm done, I'm going to lunch at Primarty from any brothers, which I tweeted. So if anyone wants to go, stay here. Other folks will be coming. If you haven't really had any real Pittsburgh food yet, this is the one. All right, back to, I'm gonna go back now. Questions? Rosemary, please. Well, again, it depends what questions we have for each prototype. Every single session we go into, for all of those 1,000 observations, 500 interviews, sometimes we're all just looking to see what happens. Yeah. But most of the time, we always have a set of questions and we want to know. So when we wanted to figure out how to gamify that experience and make it social, we did an escape room using that um, HoloLens, two of them actually, and embedded them into that experience. Yeah. And that's what we wanted to know. We weren't so much focused on what was the content that they took away. But when we were working with them individually in the hall, at that point, we weren't asking the social question, it was the content retention one. So okay, okay. we care about all of that and more, but we decide when we want to ask those questions. Yeah. And because we're prototyping and iterating, we focus on one thin slice. The goal isn't to build everything at once, it's to build something that can answer just that question or a series of questions. And then if we like that, if we figured out how that works well, then we can say, great, we can use this now, this thing we've developed, to answer some other questions, then we can ask those. Great. And it might be using exactly what we had with new sets of questions, or it might be doing some tweaks to it to say, ah, now how can we address the social piece? We got the content piece, or vice versa. You've been nodding so thoughtfully, I bet you have a question. Me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, but, so think about it. I'm going to call on you. <laughs> hey, um, first of all, What's your name? Uh, Alexia. So my name is Alexia. From? Uh, I'm from Hong Kong. I work for a think tank called the Jesus Tank. Thank you. Uh, I'm a big fan of your blog. Uh, oh, thank you. I didn't pair.
higher ups. So two, two separate questions there. So, the f so um, I was very fortunate that when I started, I've been at the museum for over five years, but this work started, as I mentioned, a year ago. And so I was moved into this section. Many of us in that space were new. Some had worked in some areas of the museum. Most folks were new to the museum. So I had an opportunity to pull from people who've been working in architect firms, in design labs, and learn from them what these ideas meant for them. I'm not coming in with any particular expertise. I have no particular training in this. It's just been self-taught. So I want to hear from them. What have they learned in their studies? What did they use in their practices? What did they find useful so that we could come up as a team with practices that made sense for us? It, it's not useful for me to do an evaluation process to help them develop their products if they're not going to find what I'm producing useful for them. So it had to be a collaboration. So the first part was finding out what do we already have in common from design thinking, and then how do we build that into the norm of the team? And then how do we train those who are not used to design thinking to understand the value of this? That why it's not just, we know right away, you can tell when you look at somebody if it works or not, why do we need to get all this data, right? Or why do we need to come up with personas? All the different things we might do with user-based thinking. Um, and so th those, that took many months. Um, both to get buy-in from up high, which I'll talk about in a moment, but then to work with folks who are not part of this process to see for them how it could be valuable, right? So there's that. For the, um, the higher-ups, that's still an ongoing process. We as an institution, while we have one area that was given this permission for a year to do this public prototyping, it very much goes against the grain of the institution. Um, it's something we've been pushing the envelopes for in the digital team and exhibitions in recent years, but it's something that the museum only recently bought into the idea of it's okay to take something unfinished to the public. That was a radical idea for us. Matt's nodding. He's like, yep, that was true. And a funder came to us and said, we want you to prototype for a year. And here, here's a chunk of money to do it. And we want you to do it across departments. That allowed us to do the work. And by doing the work well and communicating why we were doing it the way we were doing it, did we get there 100% to educate the higher ups? No. But we got there far enough that they could allow this work to continue and create the possibility space for other areas like Matt's to do the same. But it's an ongoing process. It's 12.06. I don't want to hold you from lunch. Uh, if you want to come up and talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, come on up. And if you're staying for going out to lunch, just hang out, and we'll go after. You get french fries on your sandwiches. Thank you.